Clam. Now, this is a battle to the death as far as the clam is concerned. If the starfish is able to open him even a little bit, he can get op him open all the way. And that's it, of course, for the clam. He's the starfish's lunch. No, Chris, that's not where babies come from. <laughs> All right, you got to hand it to Trump. It's never dull. Out with McMaster, in with Bolton. This Bolton, not this Bolton. <laughs> it's a strong choice. When John's mustache enters the room, you know he's not far behind. <laughs> Good joke. He's a friend to our allies and despises our enemies. I'm happy for him, but I'll also miss him. He was a frequent guest on my last show, Red Eye. <laughs> So frequent a guest, we called him the president of Red Eye. He even delivered a state of the show address. I'm happy to report that Red Eye host Greg Gutfeld has taken my advice to stop taking prescription pills before each show. I believe this course of action will help him finally to be able to correctly pronounce difficult words like Monte Teo, irreconcilable, and the. <laughs> Good luck, my little handlebarred hobbit. <laughs> but that wasn't the story of the week. Biden wants to fight Trump. That is the story of the week. This would be the greatest day for the makers of Ben Gay. <laughs> when a guy who ended up becoming our national leader said, I can grab a woman anywhere and she likes it, and then said, I, I made a mis I didn't make a mistake, but they asked me, would I like to debate this gentleman? And I said, no. I said, if we were in high school, I'd take him behind the gym and beat the hell out of him. Mm, that is some tough talk. I'd kick your ass if I were in high school. <laughs> That's like saying I'd kick your ass if I were a giant clam. It's a biological impossibility. Anyway, Trump took that bait faster than Kevin Spacey on the set of To Catch a Predator. <laughs> The original joke was worse. <laughs> All right, just remember that. Trump tweeting that Biden would go down hard and crying all the way. Now, Biden was speaking at a rally against sexual assault, urging responsibility, but that message was drowned because these two want to throw down. The former VP and the current president of the United States of America. Biden's 75, Trump is 71. Together, that's like 300 years. <laughs> Two old guys fighting shirtless. It'd be like watching two pieces of driftwood grappling in low tide. <laughs> or two tube socks packed with prunes tumbling in a dryer. <laughs> but I'd watch it, I'd watch every <laughs> second of it. Imagine, imagine, imagine the pay-per-view. Are you ready for an early bird brawl, a melee of the mature, a Geritol free-for-all, a fix-it at fracas, and non-stop action with two men in traction? Then set your life alerts to stun because it's the Battle of the Really Old Guys 2020. With the combined age of 150 years, it's Joe the Curmudgeon Bludgeon Biden versus Donald Knuckle Sandwich Trump. It's a feud among fossils, a bout with potential for doubt, an altercation featuring an omelet station. They were born before computers. They can remember when people rode horses, and they get colonoscopies regularly. Good for them because it's really important. You've never seen a rumble this slow. This senior scrap is 12 rounds of awkward sounds, a clumsy tussle requiring frequent bathroom breaks, and the first 100 people to arrive get a lifetime supply of butterscotch candy. So grab your insurer and your most comfortable orthotics because it's the battle of the really old guys 2020 featuring an undercard match between liz poke and pocahontas warren versus brawl and betsy devos now this is all fantasy they're not really gonna fight for one thing neither of them want to mess up their hair <laughs> but if this is Joe's audition to take on Trump in 2020, I think he's making a mistake. He's trying to steal voters from Trump, and this is what he lifts from him, his least appealing trait. Trump's got better ones, his strong stance on terror, his love for law and order, his fun rallies. That's why we live with Trump's often rough talk. Believe me, if he weren't getting lower 
unemployment or tax cut bonuses and talks with North Korea, Trump the personality wouldn't be half as popular. Fact is, everyone has a talent. A skunk has one, a peacock has one, but a skunk can't impersonate a peacock or vice versa. So Joe, stick to what you know, like hugs. Here we go. Look at that. Okay. Goes on a little too long. He won't, yep, yep, there it is. She's feeling uncomfortable. Yep, all right, enough. He just can't let go. <laughs> Period. Right. Let us welcome tonight's guest. He's so bright, you'll see spots when he leaves. He's the leading philosopher, psychologist, and all-around godfather of the internet. His YouTube channel has almost one million subscribers. His latest book is 12 Rules for Life. It's University of Toronto psychology professor Jordan Peterson. <laughs> all right. He's nailed more rolls than a perverted baker. <laughs> the great actor, Daniel Roebuck, he's got an excellent new film out called Getting Grace. She's no waitress, but she brings a lot to the table. Nash Review reporter, Kat Dimp. Yeah! And he can't play hide and seek. Impact wrestler, my massive sidekick, Tyrus. Dr. Peterson, you are a psychologist, a renowned psychologist. If you look at America as a patient, how would you diagnose it when you see how our political, uh, all the political uh, conflicts are going now? Split personality, obviously. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Tribal? Increasingly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be driven by the failure of the standard media, at least to some degree. Mm-hmm. You mean CNN? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. You don't yeah. mean Fox News, do you? No, I definitely <laughs> don't mean Fox News. Yeah. Well, I think that, that as uh, readership and viewership shrinks, it's easier to use clickbait and to use tactics of, of what, indignation to mm -hmm. attract uh, decreasing viewership. Mm -hmm. And that that might be driving the polarization to some degree. Yeah. That's partly a technological transformation. Yeah, it seems like uh, in terms of polarization, people, people are seeking order out of chaos, mm -hmm. right? They like to hear the things that they want to hear, and uh, that's just the way, isn't how, isn't that how we all are? We just like to be around people that are like us? Yeah, well, we, we, but we, in the past, we've been able to maintain a reasonably civil dialogue. Yeah. Like, I haven't seen things this polarized, I don't think, since the 1970s, since yeah. the early 1970s. Yeah. And so it's kind of an ugly mess, and I think a large part of that, I do believe, is driven by the by the universities and their, their continual production of people who are radically left in their political orientation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. so uh, the identity politic that is, that is now putting the group before the individual. Yeah, it's a terrible thing to do that. And mm -hmm. it, it is an invitation to tribalism, and tribalism is an invitation to conflict. Mm -hmm. So you'd think that we, the great, one of the great achievements of the West, as far as I'm concerned, is that we figured out a long time ago, maybe several thousand years ago, that the individual should always be superordinate to the state, mm -hmm. right? That's the great discovery of Western civilization. All right, Professor Dan. Yeah. <laughs> No, doctor, I was a doctor in Lost, Dr. Arst. Mm -hmm. so I have that going you were a doctor in I Lost. Was. I was. I was nowhere near as smart as Dr. <laughs> Dr. Preston Jordan, though. But I, I am intrigued by this whole idea mm -hmm. that we're, I mean, we love sports, and that's tribalism, right? Right. We're all into that. Yes. So we've done that, and I always thought that maybe was the thing that we that we put instead of like fighting we all had sports teams mm, yeah am i wrong i don't know i'm just i did just came up with i was trying to act smart <laughs> that, <and> it <laughs> oh you thank you you oh, did a great you. job you did I a was great so nervous so i wanted well, to you are an actor I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're a fantastic well, sports, actor. at least everybody plays by the same rules right so there's an overarching theme of cooperation right we all so know, that's yeah. a big deal and we could get along tribally as long as we had an overarching system of cooperation and at least in principle that was respect for the individual mm. but now that that in itself is under attack and that's a very bad thing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. tyrus huh what you think i'm processing still <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more upset about that you think everyone wants to hang around people that look and mm -hmm. act like them you know how lonely i would be <laughs> for a 6'8 black and Scottish powerlifter conservative. 
<laughs> just be walking just sad all the time. Like, man, like my best friend would be Sudan who just passed away, the rhino. That'd be it. Be nothing. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and here, this is the media's fault again. Mm -hmm. This, by here, CNN and the super left, they're looking, even if you don't, they're shoving people in the fight. Right. Biden actually made those comments in the, before the election. Mm hmm and he was at a rally where the where the came up and he explained why because he was talking about how important and how strongly he felt against men saying inappropriate things towards women and doing things and and you know we all know about the grabbing and whatever and that was the issue. They just took that and were like he said he wants to fight Trump. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. going to run for president. But I'm probably like damn, I was just accepting some money at a rally just making some you know they literally are just trying to push anybody into a fight with Trump. And it's he, that was the first time he said it, not this latest time we're talking about. Yeah, he yeah. said it before, yeah. and they brought it back. Like it was brand new. Right. He was retelling the story of what he said before, but yeah. that information is not needed because maybe we could throw him to fight Trump. Nobody yeah. wants to fight Trump right now. Nobody yeah. wants to go. No one wants to start running for president now. Well, there, I, it's completely you're going to be forgotten. You nobody can do Trump well, Kat, except for Trump. Like you can't like if he can be pretty rough and 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 sloppy with his rhetoric. If you try to do it, then he comes right after you. I think we saw that in the debates. Remember when little Marco tried to be tough and he just ended up looking absolutely ridiculous. I just wanted to say that normally mm -hmm. I would love to watch two seventy-something-year-old men fight. Yes. <laughs> However, not when my tax dollars are paying for at least one of their medical expenses. <laughs> I will not allow this. I will not allow this. You know, did, maybe President Obama was right about Obamacare. Maybe he was just planning for this fight. May <laughs> but do you think, so, like, would they fight by the Marcus of Queensbury rules? That's, you know, we're talking about, like, would they both be, okay, agree, with no punching of the face, we just, you know. This is a good point. we got to wrap it up. But you know what? This is progress. It's not a duel. <laughs> Like, we've moved from duels to this. And but then, who's the dude that, what, what's the Hamilton? You can make a musical out of this. Aaron, yeah. Like, it is Hamilton, Aaron Burr, right? I don't know my history. All I know is that they rapped back then. <laughs> According to the musical. Go to commercial, right. stop. Go to commercial, stop. Am I in trouble? All right, the Austin bomber, the Vegas shooter, the ISIS terrorists in France, what do they have in common besides sucking? That's next. <laughs> What is terror? On Friday, an armed man in France took people hostage in a supermarket, killed three people before cops took him out. ISIS says, that's one of our <laughs> On Wednesday, the Austin bomber blew himself up. It's what we call in the Gutfeld house a happy ending. But the conversation now has shifted to what to call him. Cops said he was a troubled person. The media got pissed and said, no, he's a terrorist. So is he a terrorist or is he troubled? It's kind of a no-brainer. He's both. After all, he who terrorizes is a terrorist. But the media denies the differences between the types of terror. It's just easier to identify terror when the terrorist shouts his aims, which the radical Islamist does. It's the media, for some reason, who just can't hear it. But there are bigger questions out there than labels. It's been six months since the Vegas massacre, and we're just getting new video from the Mandalay Bay Hotel showing the fiend duping staff into lugging his weapons. So how different is he or the bomber from ISIS? Well, ISIS is driven by a toxic belief tied to an afterlife of great reward. The bomber or the shooter, both were also driven by a toxic belief tied to an afterlife of great reward. The toxic belief is nihilism, the reward is infamy, and get this, the God is the media who rewards them with attention. You may not get 72 virgins, but your Wikipedia page will get more visits than Mount Rushmore. Oh. Yeah. Here he is. <laughs> Dr. Peterson, this is kind of your wheelhouse. I, all of these deeds share one thing in common, that's planning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can look even back at 9-11, but you can look at Vegas. Vegas is, a, Vegas is a plan that we weren't expecting, and that's why it gets pulled off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the planning element is a really interesting part of it because you have to brood horribly for a long time before you come up with something that reprehensible. You have yeah. to go to very, very, very dark places, and you have to dwell in them voluntarily for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and the thing is, what kills me about the Parkland incident mm -hmm. is that 
they had suggested he be institutionalized like two years ago. But somehow, I think we've demonized the idea of mental institutions to a point where we won't incarcerate them. Well, you know, there's reasons to be hesitant about institutionalizing people just because they hypothetically pose a threat, right? I mean, the ratio of people who pose a threat to the people who actually do something terrible is unbelievably high. And so these yeah. things are unbelievably hard to predict and, and prevent. Yeah. But it does look, in his case, like the warning signs were everywhere. Yeah. And no one, and no, they, everybody said, saw something, but they did nothing. Uh, Dan, you were in an interesting movie in the 1980s called River's Edge. River's Edge. I always talk about. I love that film, and it was about a teen. You played a teenage killer who killed his girlfriend. Yeah, had no. He had no concern about it. Yeah. At all. Yeah. He was talking. He yeah. killed her. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and then uh, and then he bragged about it, showed it to his friends. It what was, is and that was based? Unfortunately, that was based on a real incident. Yeah. Neil Jimenez wrote uh, the. It was based on a an incident where a kid killed his girlfriend in high school and then took his friends to see it. Yeah. Uh, very, very despondent, lonely do you think, people. What do you, what do you make of the, this nihilistic kind of vein that you're seeing? Is it nihilism? Is well, I, 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 you know, you're, I mean, I, I, it depresses me. I mean, that's why I made a movie where people, you know, could celebrate life. How do we get people to, how do we, we may not be able to get them in, into institutions, but how do you get them to celebrate life mm -hmm. instead of like getting into that dark place like you're talking about and venting and being so angry? I, I don't, I'm just an actor. I don't have an answer, but it, it is, there's something going on in our world where people are feeling alone and we have to figure out how to make them feel like one. And I don't even mean tribal, like in our tribe. I mean, we're all one. Yeah. You know, Kat, you sometimes feel alone, but you don't do anything really bad. Not to brag. No, I don't. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> it's a very low bar. Yeah. Whenever I feel alone, I only do things that punish myself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> But what, what's, the, what's the question other than me divulging my sad personal life on national television? What do you make of the, the fight over labeling what is terror? I think that, well, the legal definition is, has to be something that's politically motivated, right? Which mm -hmm. is what makes the difference between something like Vegas or something like Austin and not ISIS. That's what right. makes a difference. Some people are saying, though, that he might have been racially motivated, mm -hmm. but that's still not conclusive. But if that were the case, absolutely, it would be terrorism. Mm-hmm. Good point. Tyrus, uh, if, you know, evil, how can, isn't it interesting that we can't actually identify evil until it presents itself? Well, because we live in a society now where evil is somebody's good now. You know, some people, some believe it or not, some people praise mm -hmm. these behaviors and they, they put it over and they, and they, we celebrate it in ways we don't realize that we're doing it. You know, we, uh, video games where we're basically training people to be, to be assassins and to shoot and stuff that without any real responsibility. I mean, anyone can do it. We live in a free society, unfortunately. We also live in a society where we everyone has become a star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone's. If you look at look at social media, even the most everyone's got a selfie. Everyone's got everyone's the most important person in their own world. And then the reality is you're not. Mm -hmm. And there's no coping skills that I see for the people that really suffer in those things where they don't. You're not a star. You're not as cool as you think you might be. And some people take that to, and when you have a deviant personality and you have issues and you have things like that you struggle with, and then the reality is you have to face that and there's no outlets because everyone, you're not allowed to label anybody. You're not to say, well, that guy's off or he's different. You have to say, no, he's special. Everything's, everyone's, he's a volunteer. He's big. Like, you can't say that he's bad crazy. We got to do something with him. You can't say that yeah. because yeah. I'm judging. But uh, we're not very honest anymore. It's a tough one. Can I? Yeah. I, can I just say, like, what if we just stop saying the names yes. of the terrible people? No, really. Like, oh, yeah. why do we put the names on? The like, you do it. Yeah. You go into it. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody says your name again. Yeah. You're gone. Yeah. You'll never get any fame for it. I, I don't Nameless understand. Man. Yeah. Criminal, murderer, we, domestic terrorist. Loser. There's a million loser. things that you can call That's a Trump friend. strategy, and, yeah. it, and yeah. I think yeah. it works. All right, we've got to move on because we've got a lot more. Facebook got caught playing fast and loose with our personal data. What's it mean for me, you, and your cat videos? In the modern world, Massacre had an urgent message for lawmakers. No more school shootings. In one of the most powerful speeches of the day, Parkland shooting survivor Emma Gonzalez stood silent for six minutes and 20 seconds. That's the amount of time she said it took for a gunman to kill 17 people and wound 15 others on Valentine's Day at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Many in the crowd shed tears as Gonzalez stood in silence. 
There were also smaller counter protests across the nation in support of the Second Amendment. In Utah, pro gun advocates shouted freedom as they marched on the state capitol in Salt Lake City. Now back to the Greg Gutfeld Show. All right, Facebook, more like in your face, book. <laughs> that makes me laugh. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is doing damage control after millions had their info taken from his website without consent. The firm that took the info was allegedly Cambridge Analytica, who may have used the info to target voters in 2016. Meanwhile, perhaps out of fear of media vengeance, Facebook changed its algorithm, suppressing conservative views, sources, and news on its site. As a result, conservative websites have seen large drops in traffic. Liberal sites, not so much. This week, a campaign to delete Facebook accounts started gaining popularity. It seems that the market is ripe for a new social network, so I made one. Here's, here's our first ad for it. Are you worried that your social network is mining your personal information and sharing it with political operatives? I can't believe Facebook using my information to elect Donald Trump. How could they do this? It never ends with this f***ing guy. Maybe you should try Not Connected. Never heard of it. It's the world's first offline, online social network. Huh? It's on your computer right now if you want to give it a try. Hey, how did you get it on my computer? Let's not worry about that now. Just give it a try. Okay. I think I'll post a clever tweet about the president, see what happens. The key to Not Connected's highly advanced technology is that it looks just like most social networks, but you're not on the internet. In fact, you're not connected to anything. Your posts simply bypass Twitter and Facebook and end up here. Meanwhile, what do you see? Wow, it was retweeted 1,000 times. Every one of my tweets is retweeted 1,000 times. Thanks, Not Connected. You bet. Not connected for when you need real gratification with none of the real sharing. Note, not connected is just a box that lets you write stuff, but it goes straight to your trash. Cat? Cat? Yes. Is this something that you need? Yeah, probably. Yes. This Facebook stuff has got me worried. Why? I knew I shouldn't have taken that quiz called Which Friends Character Are You Based on Your W-2? <laughs> <laughs> So you filled it out. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, I think that Facebook really just didn't take this too seriously. They weren't paying attention. They felt like they were too big to fail to have to worry about our privacy too much. Mm -hmm. But if you remember MySpace, yeah. oh, wait, no, you don't. Yes. <laughs> so they better figure out what happened and try to stop it from happening again, or else maybe Mark might be the new Tom, which is exactly, who knows? Who knows what that guy's doing? I remember Tom, oh my God. Only just now, though. Okay, do you remember MySpace? When you joined MySpace, you got Tom. the first message from Tom, mm -hmm. and you thought it was an actual person. It wasn't. By the way, fun story before I get to you, Tyrus, because Thanks. you're glaring at me. <laughs> when we were on Red Eye, we had to share the floor with MySpace, because Fox had just bought MySpace and they were such a bunch of jackasses. They had a refrigerator, so they had, we all had a refrigerator. They put notes on the fridge about their food. Like don't, and they had notes on like if they had potato chips. People who put notes on their food, I don't want your food, but now I want your food. <laughs> if you put notes, you put notes on your stupid homemade soup, I'm gonna pour it in the sink. <laughs> Wait a minute, it was called MySpace? Yes. My? Yes. And you're confused <laughs> that they put their name on stuff? Yes. Mine, it's mine. Where are they? Well, Where's Tom? I hope Tom's okay. Tyrus, um, do you worry that social media is actually replacing the social life? Not in my world, but apparently in everyone else's, damn. Um, <laughs> I, I've always been dead against social media stuff. Like, I, I threw Facebook away a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have somebody who runs my social media. Oh, so I don't aren't you to... important? No, he's just a guy. He's just a, he's just a kid from my neighborhood who owes me a ton of favors. So he's <laughs> and his life is terrible. So pretending to be me for a few hours a day is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> The bar is low. I, I mean, hope he's not watching. He, you know, he wouldn't understand it anyway. Because <laughs> he's the smartest, right? Yeah, he's a moron. But this this whole thing, I think the apology was terrible. He basically said, all your data, which, ladies and gentlemen, is your pictures too. What do, this company went through all your stuff, and he was like, we're really sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, not good enough. Try that at home. Yeah. <laughs> Expose intimate details in your relationship to total strangers, and then when she finds out, go, my bad? That's, <laughs> that's basically what they did. Yeah. Not like, hey, we're going to fix this, and we're going to get to, we're going to, sorry, guys, we're, we're going we're to change to our algorithms. Facebook. Yeah. Right. Thank you. It's, it's gone. Great stuff, Greg. I know. I'm trying to find puns in my head. Dr. Peterson, what if we get rid of Facebook, but whatever takes its place is worse? Because technology always builds on the past technology, and mm. this could, we could be going in a really interesting direction. Yeah, well, we're going in about 10 inter interesting directions at the same time, I'm afraid. Yeah. And it's very difficult to understand how to monitor and control all the social media. It's such a powerful force, mm -hmm. and it changes so quickly that we really can't stay adapted to it. Yeah. You know? It's actually, we're, we're basically racing against something that's smarter than us, I think, right? Yeah, I think that's happened ever since the beginning of time, actually. Yeah, that's you know, it. yeah we do kind of fail and die after all, eventually. <laughs> so, but yeah, this is a whole new enterprise. Yes, I don't plan on dying, Dr. Peterson. I want my, <laughs> I want my brain extracted from this mm -hmm. beautiful skull and placed in a vat of nutrients, and then I can just do this show and I'll just be gurgling. <laughs> Dan, last word. How do you feel? About your brain gurgling? <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm concerned. Yeah, you. I think it's there's not going to be enough nutrients. What if it turns into like a chia brain <laughs> and it starts and, and stuff starts growing out of it? All these amazing thoughts you have. <laughs> I love it. It's so true. All right, coming up, everywhere he goes, he brings order to chaos. My exclusive interview. It's exclusive with Jordan Peterson on Living Your Best Life. That's next. The greatest thinkers alive today. His YouTube videos have been watched by millions, and he tackles topics like identity politics, personal responsibility, being a better man, and the true nature of evil. Earlier this year, Dr. Peterson gave a TV interview, and the topic turned to free speech. It went like this. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. That's fine. I think you, more power to you as far as I'm concerned. So you haven't sat there and... I'm just trying, I'm just trying to work that out. I mean... Ha, gotcha. You have got me, you have got me. <laughs> Whoops. All right. That, uh, you got to see the whole, you have to see the whole uh, interview of that is hilarious. And, uh, and it, what a perfect timing for your book. So I, I read you. had it all planned. Yeah, did you plan that? <laughs> did you, she gets part of the royalties? Mm -hmm. um, there's so many interesting things about the book. But I like the fact that you make me think that there are two versions of me. There's past Greg and present Greg. So present Greg de depends on the past. For example, if past Greg wakes up in the morning and decides not to go to the gym, present Greg is really mad because now present Greg has to go. So the, the secret <laughs> the secret of life, no, it's actually mind blowing. The secret of life is you have to do things for future Greg mm -hmm. or else life sucks. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. it's, you have a whole chapter on delayed, it's delayed gratification. Have I explained it? That's pretty good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah. Should I just interview myself now? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're pretty witty. <laughs> but what do you, um, why is that? The, it, I, you kind of paint that as the linchpin of society's survival, right? Yeah, well, it's the discovery of the future, delayed gratification, right? Right. Human beings invented time or discovered time, and we're both the only animals to really have managed it. Mm -hmm. So we have to sacrifice what's immediately gratifying for the future, and, and for our future selves, but also for other people. Right. But the, the payoff for that, I think, is, that, is the, uh, not so much happiness, but a sense of deep engagement with your life. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one of the things that I've been attempting to to make clear repeatedly in my YouTube lectures, for example, is that you need a sense of meaning to, to fortify you against the, the trouble of life, the suffering of life, and mm -hmm. mostly you find that meaning in adopting responsibility, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's not the same as pursuing happiness, or certainly not the same as being impulsive. You find the meaning by taking care of yourself and taking care of your family and taking care of your community. Mm -hmm. and, and if you fail to do those things, there's also a big price to be paid that everyone pays. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be something that we've, we've forgotten. 
we've forgotten and we've also failed to teach to young people as far right. as I can tell yeah. which is a real a mystery and a catastrophe at the same time yeah you know and you talk, basically you say if you want to change your life essentially the first thing you should do is clean your room right well I'm a traditionalist partly because of my social science training like one of the things I've learned as an active clinician and a social scientist is that most feel good large-scale interventions end badly mm -hmm. like it's really hard to take a system that's working reasonably well and make it better but it's it's easy to take a system that's reason working reasonably well and make it worse mm -hmm. and so what that knowing that and we know that that's the case that should that should encourage you to scale back your ambitions and, and if you want to make things better you could start by taking care of things that are within your control and also doing it in a way that's least likely to cause harm to other people. Mm -hmm. And so this clean your room idea has become somewhat of an internet meme, but if you try it and to try to organize those things right around you, you'll find that it's a lot more difficult and demanding than it looks. Yeah, you, it reminds me when I was in college, the people that were the loudest activists, they didn't clean their room. They, were, they, could, change, they could change the world, but yeah. they, couldn't, they couldn't change the toilet roll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's true. And they wouldn't even pay for the toilet roll. You know, the, 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 uh, I love this. Uh, there's so many good things in here. And I, I, I want to talk about the lobsters yeah. because you do a chapter on lobsters. And it really does tell you about the kind of sobering meaning of life. Because what exists in lobsters exists in humans. Mm. And you could take the leap from there of how it relates to the rise of Christianity in Jesus Christ. Is that fair to say? That's a tough leap, that last one. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> lobsters, uh, the suffering of lobsters is based on a dominance hierarchy. Yes. And the dominance hierarchy exists among humans. Well, the point that I was trying to make in, in that chapter, which is the first one among others, is that like the radical leftists have a proclivity to blame hierarchy and inequality on Western culture and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And look, inequality can be a real problem because people stack up at the bottom and that can destabilize your entire society. And no one likes poverty. Like yeah. no one's in favor of poverty. But the, the problem is, is that the reasons for inequality are much older than human society itself. And mm -hmm. so when the radical leftists play their linguistic games, let's say, and blame all of that on capitalism, then they're not treating the problem with its requisite seriousness. Mm -hmm. Like We actually don't know what to do about radical inequality mm -hmm. and demolishing the Western system, well, unless you bring everyone down to zero, which is something that's happened before, is not mm -hmm. going to address the issue. Yeah. And so that was the point that I was making in with the With the lobsters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the lobsters exist way before us and they have inequality, mm -hmm. horrible inequality based on dominance hierarchy. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only reason why I brought up Christianity, and I know we have to go, is because it was a remedy to dealing with the equality if, if every individual is seeking truth that you know, is your, your best bet eh? yeah like your best bet to moving forward through life despite the fact that it's extraordinarily difficult is to look clearly at what's in front of you and to tell the truth and to speak the truth mm -hmm. there's an idea a deep idea that's that's laid out in the biblical corpus that the being that you extract from the future let's say when you're making your choices if